in high school. Um, you were in high school? In high school. <laughs> uh, Rosenkranz, Valdin, told us that uh, the atom uh, is not only di divisible, uh, but you have a nucleus where you can find... Uh, Po uh, you, where you can find um, um, protons, and, protons and, and neutrons, and then you have electrons going around them. But then it turned out that the protons and the neutrons are again uh, divided into smaller and smaller particles, and they on their part are again divided. And then at the end of the 20s, around the end of the 20th century, I had the pleasure and honor to interview uh, uh, Yakira, Professor Yakira Aronov, whom you know. Yeah. And he said that at the end of the 19th century, there were small leftovers in physics that, were there, that awaited their solution in the 20th century. And now, he said, we are at this, the end of the 20th century and still there are some leftovers waiting for the 21st century. Now, the first, the, the first quarter of the 21st century has passed and still we don't have toe, we don't have the theory of everything. So the question is, is physics actually metaphysics? Metaphysics is a good state because metaphysics deals with the, with the concepts that underlie reality and it's a legitimate quest. I think the more terrifying question is physics a form of mysticism. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more terrifying because we rely, rely on physics for a variety of tasks and so on. We'll talk about it when we come to technology, when we're going to discuss technology. Sending things to the moon, the moon and, and, to Mars. and back, hopefully. Back, back and so on. people, and yeah. dogs. Physics is where alchemy used to be, more or less, right now. I know it's, it's shocking. It is shocking. And people would protest. Alchemy. Especially Ooh. physicists would protest, yeah. But it is where alchemy used to be. What were the two hallmarks of alchemy? A preoccupation with language. You had spells, you had magic formulas, you had, you know. So there was a preoccupation with words, with language. That was the first. And the second hallmark of alchemy was the belief that there was a universal um, kind of invariant truth. And if you were just to reach this core of truth, you will acquire the power of the gods. You will be able to transmute the, the uh, um, any metal, any metal to gold. gold. You will gold. be able. You will be able to find the philosopher's stone and so on. Because, and and everyone was convinced that it's only a question of time before we we reach this this power, this invariant truth, this core of truth, this rock of truth that's hurtling in space. You know, somewhere. So. Physics has exactly the same two hallmarks. It's obsessed with language. It's, a, it's, it's about language, mostly. For instance, what I said, neutrons, protons are, uh, are divided. These quarks, quarks, for example, are metaphor, metaphorical creations. Uh, no one really believes they exist. It's, they it's, have it's color, a, they have taste. Yeah, color and taste are, are attributes, they characteristics. Have spin. Yeah. But a uh, good physicist would tell you that these are language elements, you know. So, physics is, is a language, it's about language, and it's hermeneutically and hermetically sealed in its own space. And the debates between physicists very often, I would say 90% of the time, are about how to interpret certain language elements, or which language to use, or how to use the language. It's about language, exactly like alchemy. And the second element is that physicists still believe, to this very day, that they are asymptotic to the truth. They're approximating, they're on the way to the truth. You know, it's just a question of time. Like Yakir told you, yes, a brilliant, a brilliant yeah. scientist. Like Yakir Argonov told you, yeah, we have a few loose ends and we will, you know. There is this feeling that we are we'll making... We'll get there eventually. We'll get there. There's a feeling we are making progress. Yes. Progress towards what? <laughs> progress towards what? towards an invariant, cold, clear, objective, indisputable truth. A rock. This is alchemy. This is alchemy. Scientific theories are not about reality. Good scientific theories. 
don't, they're not about reality. Scientific theories are about other scientific theories, and scientific theories are self-referential. They are about themselves. Hmm. Scientific the theories are forms of discourse. Discourse that spans generations and previous ways of thinking. Discourse that is self-references in order to generate hypotheses, because only when you refer to yourself as a theory, you can generate hypotheses. And these hypotheses can be tested and hopefully falsified. I'm saying hopefully falsified because then you have an impetus to create a new theory. And so it's a, a self-referential exercise. And in many ways, scientific theories are allegories. They're allegories, they're metaphors, they're analogies, you know. A form of glorified literature using a highly formal structured language called mathematics. You know. It's still literature. It's descriptive, it's predictive, and it's wrong. It's wrong? Yes. All scientific theories are wrong. How do I know? Because all scientific theories in the past have been falsified. All scientific theories in the past had been proven wrong. Why would I think that our current theories are right? Why? The second uh, law of thermodynamics? It's a new theory. Ah, what do you mean all? All scientific theories in the past Five or uh, two thousand five hundred years. Have been All probably. those, not only those. Uh, the phlogiston was in the seventeenth century, eighteenth century. Ether. Ether was in the nineteenth century. It's not so, not so far. Yes. So, the only thing we know for sure about our scientific theories is, is that they're wrong. So, and even Newtonian Newtonian mechanics, to a large degree, had been falsified because. Newtonian mechanics applies to you and me and this, uh, this glass, yeah, applies well. But it doesn't apply to 99.999999% of the universe. Newtonian mechanics does not apply to galaxies and black holes. Because they go so fast. They, they are relativistic, they're, yeah. They're so they're far. They're relativistic. And Newtonian mechanics doesn't apply to elementary particles. Oh, right. Of course. Because this, is, this, is what, this was his complaint. The so we could, we could say that it's been falsified, definitely. <laughs> we could say it's a private case of some kind. So these are the only th things I know about scientific theories. So I prefer to think of them as allegories or analogies. Yes, there is a generation of hypotheses. This is, that's what differentiates them from stories. But even when you read Dostoevsky, and you stop at page 286, you can generate a hypothesis about the brothers Karamazov. Definitely, you can generate a hypothesis. You can say, he's going to behave this way. She is, he's going to behave that way. And this is a hypothesis. And then 200 pages later, it's falsified. So even that is a form of theory. You know? And so it's crucial to understand that physics is an extension of metaphysics. The danger is not that it is an extension of metaphysics. The danger is that if you insist that you are making progress towards an immutable, unchangeable truth, you are not a physicist. Immutable, unchangeable truth. Uh, immutable is unchangeable. Yes. Uh, I said unchangeable because some people don't know what is immutable. Okay. So uh, if you insist on this, then you are not a physicist and you are not a metaphysicist. You are a mysticist. Mystical. It's, it's mysticism. So that's the danger. Danger, in my view, is that physics is fast deteriorating into the realm of mysticism. You know, Clark said that um, given good enough science, it's indistinguishable from magic. So what, what do you prescribe then? First of all, we must go back to philosophy and metaphysics. We've forgotten as physicists, now I'm talking as a physicist, we had forgotten our roots. We are rootless. We have forgotten our roots. We think we invented the world. We, I mean, so we need to go back and examine the, the concepts that underlie our thinking. And we can do this only through philosophy and metaphysics. Now, such concepts exist in every scientific theory, not only physics. For example, take evolution, evolutionary the evolution theory. When you read the, the theory, which, by the way, is extremely badly written in Darwin's book. It's not a scientific theory. I don't know what it is, but it's not scientific theory. It's a travelogue, maybe. But it had become a theory later. 
By neo-Darwinists. By, by neo-Darwinists, by people like Stephen Gould, who suggested the punctuated equilibrium by observations. By, so, uh, evolution theory of today, Darwin would not have recognized, definitely. <laughs> but it has become a theory. But even evolution theory relies on a metaphysical foundation, because it assumes that organisms want to survive. Exactly. Okay. But this is metaphysics. Darwin didn't address the question, why would, uh, no. why would anything want to survive? Want to survive? No. Why would no. anything want to excel? Well, the minute you say something wants something, that's not science. That's metaphysics. So evolution theory... Teleolo teol teleology. 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 Teleology is part of metaphysics. It's not science. It cannot be science. So evolution is founded on, on metaphysics, the wish to survive. And others, other, other, other. Take, for example, uh, special relativity theory, ostensibly the quintessential scientific theory in physics or physical theory. It's founded on the assumption that observers are separate from the systems that they observe. That's why they can get different time measurements, different space measurements, because they are not there. They are just observing. They are not, for example, affecting time or affecting space or affecting the observed system. Now, we know it's not true because we know, for example, that when we try to see an electron, we influence the trajectory of the electron because we are shooting, we are shooting a photon. Exactly. And it changes. And it, the moves the, it moves. moves the this is the Heisenberg, Heisenberg uncertainty, uncertainty principle. principle. So we know that at least on the micro level, special relativity cannot be true, end of story, because it relies on a metaphysical, not physical, metaphysical principle that an observer and an observed system can be non-communicating, can be non-influencing each other, which is a metaphysical principle. It's not, it's not science, you know. Similarly, if you look at the philosophy of science, the principle of falsifiability, the principle the number one principle, the, the principle by which we determine if a scientific theory, if a theory is scientific or not, in itself is metaphysical. It's metaphysics. Why? What does the principle say? The principle says, if you have a theory and you can falsify it, then it's scientific. But the principle also says, you can falsify only scientific theories. So we call this tautology. Yes. It's a tautology. I'm telling you, um, if you eat meat, it proves that you are carnivorous. And but if you're you are carnivorous... Meat, but you eat meat only if you're carnivorous. Of course, I said nothing. I didn't add any new or information. Or you said twice the same thing. Or I said the same thing twice, tautology. That's falsifiability. That's absolutely falsifiability. The whole foundation of science, falsifiability, which is not the accepted principle, is a tautology which we know tautologies are forbidden in science. Right. Absolutely forbidden. Yeah. Even in philosophy, they're forbidden. Uh -huh. and the whole thing rests on this. You know? um, consider, for example, the enormous confusion between language and truth. A mathematician, very typical, typically, would give you a page, so you see, you see, the, the equation leads to this, so it must be true, <laughs> without realizing that relying on language is a metaphysical principle. Because, for example, it assumes that language correlates somehow with reality. Maybe it doesn't. There is an assumption that mathematics is a language, and it's only a language, it's a formal language. There is an assumption that mathematics somehow should, should reflect on reality, or teach us something about reality, or somehow connect to reality. And even their schools, in formal logics and so on, let's say, anything that can happen must happen. Like, all the potentials must be realized. So, but people don't stop to say, wait a minute, we need to examine language itself before we use it. We need to see how many of our assumptions about language, which are metaphysical assumptions, are true, are real. And we need to even consider the following. The only way for us to examine language is with a meta-language. And we don't have that. And, and even if we invent it, it's a language. So we would need a meta-meta-language. 
right. in a meta-meta language. So you could safely say there's no way to ascertain the validity or the relevance of any language you're using. So this is totally an article of faith. It's a leap of faith, Kierkegaard. <laughs> Leap so you have, you, have to believe you have to believe that if you talk about triangles and 180 degrees or, whatever. And, or uh, anything, hypotenuse and so anything. on, uh, anything. You, you, you'll, you'll say the truth. Which leads, me, the truth. Which leads me to, the, to, the, to, the, to what I'm saying. Science is a religion. It's a faith, faith-based system. It's a faith-based system that has one advantage. It helps us to survive. It does. Via technology and so on. So it's a, a little more efficient than religion. Yeah. But religion helped people survive in the Middle Ages. Too. Too. So, but it's a religion. Any claim to the contrary, it's a faith-based system. Any claim to the contrary is a denial of the reality that all of science is founded on metaphysics. You're yeah. saying religion helped people be more ethical although they helped people also be more savage. Uh, they helped uh, create uh, cathedrals. Psychologically and, also. And, you know. and, and science helped uh, place people, uh, men on the moon and so on and so forth. But we have to realize that they're both... Faith-based systems. Faith-based systems. The faith-based system. In science, we simply believe in some things. These are foundational things. They're not fringe issues. They're not tangential issues. This is the core of science. The core of science is totally non-provable, metaphysical, philosophical, the core, and requires a leap of faith. If you don't make this leap of faith, you can't do science. Because the minute I put pen to paper, I make a series of assumptions, for example, about the validity and power of mathematics. For example, about the existence of reality, which is in itself a metaphysical thing. <laughs> I, I, make, I make hundreds of assumptions that long before I put pen to paper as a physicist. You know. And all these assumptions are unprovable, axiomatic, not derived, not derivative. And, and so I need to believe. I need to be a believer. And, and the power of reason, of course. And, and are you a believer? And the power of reason. Are you a believer? Of course I'm a believer. I want to survive. You want to survive. Yeah, but I'm not a believer. I'm not a naive believer. Not a naive believer. I'm a believer because it works. You, you, you know that you believe. I don't. But if I'm right, there's no reason in principle why we would not have a totally different faith-based system in the future. Because not re reason is not primary. We tend to think that reason is primary because it's an element of our faith. Right. I mean, it's also a metaphysical thing. I don't think uh, reason is primary. I think faith is primary. You could believe in God, you can believe in science, but you have to believe. This, is, this brings me to, to, to this point. Uh, many atheists, scient uh, atheist scientists say that uh, God is redundant because God um, needs belief. While you say that um, science needs belief as well, of course. so you can believe anything. Kierkegaard was right. Kierkegaard said that you need a leap of faith. Okay, he was talking about God. You can be, uh, and, and mm -hmm. many people are religious scientists. They believe yeah. in God yeah. and at the same so time. So they have two belief systems, two faith-based yes. systems. Uh -huh. But I have one, and it's called science. I'm not pretending that I have... Uh, that I'm in any way, shape, or form superior to religion. I'm just saying you religion choose, is less efficient than science. You choose not to, not to believe in, in God, but you... Yes, because it doesn't work. Religion is less efficacious than science. And tomorrow there will be, I don't know, uh, gematria in gematria. Gematria will be more efficient than science. I will become a great believer in gematria. I don't care. Whatever works.